Hello, and welcome to part three of my mycotoxin series. This series will be talking about toxicology of mycotoxins. Going to focus on one or two classes of mycotoxins, but um, hopefully you'll see that uh, the general toxicity of these compounds can be you know, very specific, but also very um, diffuse and hard to figure out. And that as a, as a class, um, the whole reason they're in the class of mycotoxins is that they are toxic. So they all have kind of their own special toxicity. So mycotoxins, natural, organic, and poisonous. You know, we think of natural and organic as being good, but of course it is not always good. And in this case, we have some of the most toxic, especially the most carcinogenic, carcinogenic natural substances that we've ever known of. So when we talk about toxicity, we often talk about something being acutely toxic or chronically toxic. If something is acutely toxic, that means um, at, a, at a dose, it's going to cause immediate health effects. Um, this could be like uh, death or it could be you know, making you sick or making you vomit. That would be something that's acutely toxic. It's immediately going to have an effect versus something that's chronically toxic. This would be something you're exposed to over a long period of time. And even though it's not making you sick, you may not even know that it's causing effects. Over time, it will have effects and it can have very, very serious effects, maybe even worse than, a, than an acute effect, but it's over time. So for mycotoxins, acute or chronic, of course, both. Today, we're gonna to talk just about one mycotoxin and this will be um, aflatoxin. So ergotamine too, that's one I mentioned in the previous video, it would also have acute effects, but today mostly aflatoxin that's on the left. And if you remember, uh, was that episode one or episode two, when we talked about the turkey poults and the um, acute toxicity when they were fed this contaminated feed, um, they all died within days, within weeks, they were sick immediately. Um, we would see that as acutely toxic. And that's the, you know, becomes the more obvious, that becomes the widely known toxicity because it is it is so apparent it's so easy to see and easy to record whereas um with chronic toxicity even though it might affect the same target such as the liver like it did in our um, turkey pulse um, even though it's the same target it affects it over time so AFB1, I'm using that abbreviation for aflatoxin B1. Remember B because it fluoresces blue, one because it's the first one. There were actually a lot of them that fluoresce blue that they had a similar structure there. Anyway, it is chronically carcinogenic, especially in rats. They found when they fed rats either contaminated feed or straight aflatoxin, uh, you know, 50 to 100% of them at some doses, 100% of the rats would get a hepatocellular carcinoma, aka liver cancer. Um, and it was very, very serious, very, very potent. Um, but anytime you do toxicology research, um, you can't put all your eggs in one basket just by looking at one animal. So of course, they did test on rats with the effects that I just said, severe um, liver toxicity. But when they looked same compound in mice, uh, no cancer. So you give adult mice these aflatoxins and they are resistant. Um, there were theories on this. Maybe this is evolutionary because mice are eating a lot of grains. They're maybe eating a lot of contaminated grains and they've got a, like almost an immunity towards it. Um, but early on, they didn't really know why. Why are mice resistant, but rats aren't? They're so similar. With humans, it's a big unknown. So we have humans, humans are different, lots of species specific differences. Um, most lab rats and lab mice are very similar to each other. They all come kind of from the same gene pool. And although we do too, we have, you know, humans are a very diverse class, very diverse species. So what happens in the human liver? We don't really know. We can extrapolate from the rodents, um, but it seems to be kind of in between the rat and the mouse. You know, it, this is not causing every human who's ever been exposed to aflatoxins, because we all are, to have liver cancer, obviously, um, but it does seem to have an effect. So how does this effect happen? This is one of our body's mechanisms gone wrong, we could call it. So cytochrome P450 enzymes, such as they're abbreviated CIPS, 
So CYP1A2, these are different isoforms. They're slightly different proteins that are all kind of there to detoxify things. When you take your ibuprofen or you take a, a drug, when you take caffeine, any drug we take, we don't want to, you know, our bodies don't want to have caffeine floating around forever. So we need an enzyme that will eliminate it. So it will change the structure so that we can excrete it. Um, that's a very good thing that happens in our bodies. But sometimes it goes wrong. Um, in the case of aflatoxin, you see in the diagram here, it is activated by this, re by this reaction. Um, it has this intermediate that makes a reactive epoxide. Epoxide is that oxygen bound to two adjacent carbons. Um, so that thing, although aflatoxin itself might have its own toxicity, that intermediate epoxide is extremely toxic. It's very, very, very toxic. How? The epoxide has very strong affinity for guanine. Guanine, again, we're doing some biochemistry quizzes here. Guanine is in your DNA. It's in all of our DNA. And when aflatoxin, this uh, reactive epoxide binds to it, um, that really interferes with our ability to replicate, to copy DNA. Um, this is kind of like, um, this is kind of like corrupting our hard drive. If DNA is our hard drive that has all our information and data, we've thrown in a bunch of aflatoxin and made it to where it can't read its data anymore. And anytime you have those kind of DNA issues, first thing that should pop into your head is cancer because that would cause mutations. That might cause mutations that would you know, cause our tissues to go haywire. That's, that's cancer in a nutshell. So when we look at that mechanism, okay, we are activating... Um, and we th think that in the context of rats versus mice versus people. So what's going on here? Um, first of all, we looked at mice. And when I say we, I mean researchers years ago, not me. But I read about it today. Um, if you look at mice, they have another step in this process. So we have our um, epoxide formation, but then you have an enzyme there called GST, glutathione S transferase, and then that takes that reactive epoxide, adds glutathione to it, and then it's very easily for us to eliminate out of our body. So that is a good detox mechanism. That, that get, gets rid of all this stuff. It's a very good thing. It has not gone haywire. It is doing its job. And what they found is that in mice, this GST, um, although in rats it's a little bit less expressed in their liver, in mice, there's a lot of it. Um, and this difference is really what corresponds to the difference in toxicity. It's not the fact that their livers are that much different. It's just the enzymes that are expressed in there are expressed to different degrees. In humans, we have quite a bit of GST, but that can also be variable. We might have, um, you know, in some people we might have more GST, in some people we might have less GST. You, you don't really know, that's kind of an uncertain. And based on other things you're exposed to, your levels of GST might be up or down. So that protective enzyme isn't that consistent. It's not something we can always rely on. So when we talk about um, this activation, uh, I was thinking there's, there's some you know, interesting things that can go on here. If you've ever taken some pharmaceuticals, they might tell you, don't take this with grapefruit juice. And if you've ever wondered why, it's because drugs are also, like I mentioned, um, metabolized, they're broken down by that CYP3A4. And it's well known that compounds in grapefruit juice and in grapefruit um, will block that enzyme. So if you think about it in the context of our aflatoxin, what would happen if we we're exposed to aflatoxin, but also grapefruit juice. Would it protect us because it would form less of this epoxide? There's actually a paper I found from 2003 that did just that. Um, they fed rats uh, grapefruit juice and found that it did protect from, um, from cancer. Um, so very interesting. If you're worried about aflatoxin and you're not taking any pharmaceuticals, maybe you should drink more uh, grapefruit juice. Um, but all jokes aside, that is just a, kind of one of these weird examples of interplay between different things. Um, that was just the toxicity of aflatoxins. I did not cover the toxicity of all the other different classes. Some of them are carcinogenic. Some of them are uh, you know, hard on the liver or the kidneys or the brain. Um, there's a wide, wide, diverse 
um, range of toxicity. Uh, there's just not time to cover all of it or else I would be very interested in looking it all up and summarizing it for you. Um, but you can look up, there's lots of review papers if you're interested to figure them out because you'll hear about a lot of different ones. Um, just look it up, They're, it's very interesting. Um, and that's it for today. I think tomorrow I will be going into um, talking about a little bit uh, of socioeconomic issues to do with mycotoxins. This is something I stumbled across that I thought was very interesting. Um, so thank you for joining and hope you tune in for the next episode.